so what we could have is a uh, you know no no i have started can you hear me okay so uh, we can have a little uh, maybe a little background uh, 45 minutes and then we have question answers is that okay or you want mainly question answers that is also okay with me thoda thoda sa background ek uh, yeah then we can enter into question answers okay so so namaste um, happy to see such interest in indian psychology and integral psychology and psychotherapy in particular uh, first thing first generally there are two ways of applying indian psychological thought to psychotherapy one is in bits and parts uh, and the other is taken as a whole i personally am a votary for taking it as a whole but then well uh, i think bits and parts also it helps to an extent by bits and parts i mean that basically we follow the um, general paradigm of psychotherapy uh, which includes you know some kind of eclectic psychotherapy uh, rational emotive therapy i am not going into psychodynamic it's a very special kind of area though there also you can apply some of these things uh, and teaching people some of the techniques like witnessing meditation like nowadays we have mindful meditation which is essentially a buddhist technique which has uh you know infiltrated down the west given a new name vipassana or looking at life the larger picture of life etc etc uh this helps of course no doubt about it to an extent but the real uh, sense comes when we understand the paradigm or the framework within which uh, or rather i would say beyond which indian uh, psychological systems operate so first thing indian psychology is not born out of thought but out of yogic experience and it makes a world of difference so by thought i mean you look at behavioral patterns you study them you try to understand you go deeper you take a lot of people and study and make some kind of notes data search research and eventually you arrive at some conclusions keep on improving upon that but the yogis uh, wanted to know what is the root of problems uh, that human beings have and what really is man to start with so let's start from there that yogis developed ways and means to discover the source origin call it the root of creation and of humanity to zoom in more particularly and the ways and means were more interior they were very logical in the sense that if there is a source of creation this source must be within everything and in some way it should be accessible to us so um, instead of taking the approach of the uh, going deeper through the sensory world and its images which essentially are a perception they went deeper into the subjective states if you look at human psychology it's the field of the subjective states much more than the uh, of course the objective is there for instance the same event the same incident the same circumstance can create different subjective states within a human being when i say states it's not just about feelings and thoughts but something still deeper a state of consciousness so they studied this these different states of consciousness and went deeper and deeper till they touched the bedrock of consciousness where they discovered a state of utter freedom vastness what they called as truth and light and peace self existent peace self existent joy and then they went on to formulate certain things which were again based on experiences and the first of these things which is very unique and uh important to understand is that man's nature human beings nature fundamentally is divine which is different from the way western psychology operates because western psychology whether you like it or not there are two frameworks one is a christian theology and the other is a kind of behaviorism and uh, a study of human being from that perspective that there is no divine entity so from that perspective you study the behavior or man's nature is a fallen nature you can tinker you can do painting denting but there is no way you can fundamentally change it so here there is a uh, the fundamental thing is that man's nature is basically divine but yet it is covered up through during a journey through the uh you know not just one life in indian thought it is many lives so we are on a journey and in this journey uh two things take place as we go further and further through this journey uh, our fundamental divine nature begins to get uncovered 
so it gets uncovered through a spate of experiences and you can take it like a seed the seed has two stages of journey one is when the outer crust melts and wastes away and the second is when the real seed core begins to sprout and come up and up it throws roots in the soil and then start being drawn by the silent attraction of the sun by the wind by the water that percolates and goes into the seed something similar happens to a human being the first stage of the journey is when we are in the shell of the ego and this shell begins to become harder and harder in in the first few um, let's say periods of uh, our existence through in the course of lives so as it gets harder and harder the world experiences initially it shrinks shrinks and then a time comes when the time has come for it to burst so it burst open and that's the stage 2 when the seed begins to take its real journey so human beings also undertake this journey in two stages one is the stage of ignorance which is where one journeys under the state of the stress of the ego self so one understands things in a certain way one evaluates them in a certain way and then one deals with life with people with this world in a certain way and the ego journey is essentially about self assertion by whatever means because that's why it has been created so first there is this need of self assertion in any which way and uh, the ego journey also has threefold uh, three stages or it moves through three streams of nature or let's put it like three tracks so at first it's a purely tamasic ego where it just it doesn't really take the challenge of the world but just endures it so that is a stage when one just endures accept things as they come doesn't much make a meaning out of them lives within a small little circle of uh, faces known loved cherished because of the family affections or immediate physical surroundings this is the first stage of the journey in the next stage it enters on track 2 which is the rajasic mode of journey in the rajasic mode it begins to assert itself it doesn't only endure but asserts but asserts um, initially by vehemence arrogance aggression ambition it tries to absorb the world or make it its own it expands itself goes beyond the little boundaries of the family and immediate physical surroundings and goes into larger larger wider shores explores invents discovers so this is the second stage uh, in the second stage as i said this is the first stage when it is more violent more aggressive more assertive in a uh, certain ambitious way and the next stage when this assertiveness this aggression tends to become tamed and tamed and becomes more and more enters into a stage when it begins to seek more equilibrium and more harmony rather than merely expansion and when this happens it enters into what is known as the sattvic stage so in the course of this journey there are many many sub types soul types if may say uh, personality types which are created depending on where we stand so there is no one perfect um, um, solution no one perfect way to look at uh, you know humanity for instance if somebody is in a tamasic mode merely enduring things so you don't tell the person that okay you start meditating and start you know uh, accepting things as fate on the contrary you have to uh, make it you know bring out that sense of assertion he has to come out he has to take the challenge of life whether he Uh, if he finds it difficult then you know we have to support from behind the person has to go take the challenge of life but if one has taken the challenge of life and is entering into more and more aggressive ambitious mode one is likely to trip over beginning to trip over that's when you have to bring in the principle of sattva or the equilibrium the balance the need for harmony the need for peace and the ways through which he can acquire that but these three modes are still the inferior mode as long as one moves in these three modes of nature which are known as uh, you know this triple mode which is basically a kind of ignorance ignorance in the sense that one doesn't know who one is then there comes a point of time when one begins to raise this question to oneself that well i am leading life but what is life uh, who am i what's my real identity what's what is this world why am i here is there a god or there is no god is there a reality or there is no reality now when these questions begin to come up a second kind of journey starts a lot of youngsters i see nowadays who go through these questionings directly or indirectly and are going through this phase which is a kind of existential anxiety you know they feel stifled in the surroundings in which they are they need more space they are looking for something other than this framework in which they live uh, and even this social 
framework, religious framework, all these frameworks which support the journey up till this point, they are beginning to look. They are beginning to look for something greater, something deeper, and that's when this second life begins, which is called a spiritual. So, spiritual life basically implies that there is something beyond our humanness. That's what is the spirit, the realm of the spirit. So, when as long as we believe there is nothing like higher than human which basically is an illogical thought because if you see the evolutionary journey, man is a product of evolution. Uh, but what is that power working from behind which has created man out of dust? Uh, we should reflect upon that. Uh, and um, if we call it God who created man, then man is a very incomplete, imperfect product. So obviously there is something which is missing in our understanding. And Shubhinda comes in and bridges this gap, even Sri Krishna speaks about it, that our evolution is not over. So all yogis and mystics have this common premise that evolution is not over. There are ranges of consciousness beyond the mind, uh, which we can consciously access. As of now, we have to make an effort to access them. So it becomes a conscious evolution. Unlike evolution thus far, up till Human beings, evolution is largely, no, it's mainly unconscious. So, uh, environment and nature create stresses uh, in an animal's life and the species can either evolve or it can disintegrate. Now, it evolves through various uh, transitional stages which are the link species which get, which vanish from the earth scene after they have served the purpose as a bridge for the consciousness to climb. Now, so also when we... Um, uh, you know, in human beings, this conscious evolution is there as a thought. That's why we have education. That's why we have teaching. That's why we are all sitting here. Because knowingly, unknowingly, we do believe that we can consciously make things better. So conscious evolution in human beings is the result of something which is there in us as a seed. We can call it seeking. We can call it yearning. We can call it aspiration. We can call it the urge to know and be better. Whatever way. It is something unique to human beings. So, uh, it's not there in animals. In whatever condition they, you put them or train them or condition them they, or nature has put them, they stay with that throughout life. But in human beings, there is this urge to change. And the sign of a developed human being is that there is a greater will to change and a greater urge to go beyond the frame of uh, the human formula. So, human formula which nature has created the average uh, humanity that we are today is not the peak of things, not the last word of creation. So the whole stress of yoga, yoga literally means union, is that human beings can unite with higher and higher levels of consciousness. At each of this uh, level, when one enters and becomes integrated with that level, it is called samadhi. That means the two states now uh, joined together in a state of balance and then further higher higher till one day we unite with the very source that is the ultimate union is accomplished between man as a creature and God as the creator. So the whole journey of man is the journey of creation to unite with the creator and this journey up till human being is done unconsciously. Nature is doing it. From human beings this onward the journey can become more and more conscious. This conscious evolution is what yoga is about. So where does integral yoga come in? Just a quick framework. So in um, normally in yoga it is, uh, um, it is said or understood that well this uh, human journey has a certain limit still even when you ascend to certain higher levels of consciousness you can go up to a point you cannot completely uh, you know divinize yourself you cannot completely change yourself what is possible is for the human soul when it ascends to a point it can catapult itself and the soul can join with with the divine whose portion it is but the nature which has nurtured, which has uh, helped in our development up to a point will be left behind. It's like the parents stay where they are, children go further and further, beyond a point they go beyond the parents to some other you know, country, some other shore where they continue with their own journey. So this is how it is understood that human nature has limits up to which it can really grow. Maybe it can become a saint, a seer, yet Beyond that point, the soul has to take its journey, leaving this nature aside and unite with the divine who is the source of all things. So that is one line of completion of the journey from creation to the creator. 
the soul which has come from there unites with the creator and that's the end of things uh, but the problem there is that then what was the journey about i mean if the soul had to go back to creator and join uh, through all this journey of pain and so much struggle is there in this journey what was all this about so here in shobindo says no the journey is not just of the soul going back to the divine and joining and be done with it not the journey from nothingness to nothingness but it is a journey from potential everythingness to manifest everythingness in in other words this journey of human life is a journey in which by joining with higher and higher states of consciousness we manifest more and more uh degrees and potentialities of the divine consciousness of our own true nature our own deeper divine nature so the entire journey of creation or evolution is nothing else but manifestation so all evolution is a way by which nature is trying to manifest the divine presence which is within it through names and forms and possibilities and potentialities and we can understand that i am sure this must have been taken up in the class that we have matter in which one quality manifests then living beings in which a whole range of qualities and capacities begin to manifest and then in human beings again there is a whole range of capacities and qualities just to take one one particular capacity to understand when human beings uh, come on earth in the most primitive stages um, before speech sound is there sound is inherited from the animals then there are animals in which there is not even sound so if you take the indian theory that ultimately all creation started with a vibration a mighty vibration in indian thoughts called as nad brahman but if you want to take the uh, pure physics way it is like the um, the big bang so there is this nad with which creation started now slowly this nad first builds forms and names and there is a subconscious vibration there in this whole creation as energy patterns uh, movement patterns rhythms of day and night etc but in um, higher animals it begins to take the form of sound and then in human beings it takes the form of words now this nad can go on evolving through human instrument until it reaches subtler and subtler thoughts and then ultimately the highest intensity of speech which human beings are capable of and that is the mantra so the entire journey of nad nad we cannot perceive it Uh, it's a tremendous vibration but human instruments can manifest something of that power of that nad original nad in in the form of word and the the whole purpose of this uh, the rishis to embody higher states of consciousness was to ultimately become a mantra drishta so this nad this mantra has now the power of creating just as the original nad has the power of creating this creation by receiving something of these higher states and expressing it through the human speech the human word it has the power to create now this is direct implication in um, even in our everyday life leave it aside psychotherapy uh, we have not yet explored the full potential of the word uh, words can destroy they can destroy relationships they can destroy uh, you know um, many things in this creation sound can destroy sound is the part to destroy but the word and the sounds can also create they can create a healing atmosphere they can create actually conditions of health so by potentiating this energy of the word within us uh, we can arrive at a state by mantra i don't just mean uh, you know uh, chanting some shlokas in sanskrit that's not the point the point is can the word embody that original vibration well through higher states of consciousness it can embody it and when it embodies these higher vibrations like the seers of old and even modern times you don't have to go through a long complicated process of psychotherapy sometimes it's enough just to say a word you know uh, i don't know some of you of course you all are very young you may not have experienced you now it is uh, when you go to a doctor he gets into very complicated mental apparatus so you go there with whatever maybe a little cough and cold and you go through entire testing and retesting you are going through apprehensions whether it is corona or something else and the doctor is also in that state and at the end he passes a verdict goes through treatment etc etc now this is typically the way much of psychotherapy is it tries to analyze the behavior tries to understand etc and then tries to put something here something there at the end of it uh, so that you can come back to your healthy state 
but that's not how indian psychotherapy works so indian psychotherapy goes to the root of it so the what is the root of any distress any problem uh, anything which is critical it is the state of ignorance the more we get into denser states of ignorance the more we experience the burden of life so in a tamasic state you experience the entire creation as a burden world is a burden so people in that state cannot take the challenge of life they want to just shut themselves off in a box and they feel comfortable the moment they move out into this world they find it very burdensome so uh, this this power of the word which can actually make them move forward and take the challenge of life take for example you have this uh, when you read the gita arjuna falls into a tamasic state he says i want don't want to fight what does shri krishna tell him at that point of time he doesn't reveal the highest truth he simply says that you are being a coward you you wake up this not your true nature wake up conquer उत्तिष्ठता जागृता प्राप्य वरानी भूतिथ आर आईज अवे कैन स्टॉप नॉट टिल द गोल इज रीच नॉ दीज वर्ड्स हैव द पावर टू रिलीज सम पेंट अप स्पिरिचुअल एनर्जी विद इन ए ह्यूमन बींग बिकॉज दे हैव बीन दे आर द रिजल्ट ऑफ सर्टन स्टेट्स ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस एट विच इट इज वेरी नेचुरल एंड नॉर्मल टू फील लाइक दैट राइट नाउ इट्स नॉट नेचुरल एंड नॉर्मल सो वेन दीज वर्ड्स कम एंड स्ट्राइक द रिसीवर वेन ए रिसीवर इज इन ए स्टेट ऑफ फेथ एज इन ए टिपिकल Uh, you know doctor patient setting it starts releasing the person's own potential to heal oneself take for example now coming back to this whole corona thing now you know we enter into very complicated mental process and okay that's one way to operate but there is another way which we all i mean some of us have experienced it with doctors uh, when so many complicated mental ways were not there that the doctor simply said he did not he also did not Go into all these things. He simply said, "Beta, sardi juka mogiya, theek ho jayega." You know, you have a, you have flu. It's okay. Take rest. Drink lot of fluids. Take some nice lozenges, vitamin C. Take this syrup. You'll be fine. Now, this word was so powerful that we felt so reassured. And we, what happens when we felt feel reassured? It activates our own healing processes. We have faith that we can be cured. now this faith as an ingredient is important from the point of view of the recipient and this power to release the healing processes in a human being whether it be medical physical condition or a psychological condition or even spiritual distress is what the psychotherapist has to have at its his command in other words the psychotherapist cannot apply these things purely mentally i cannot say people that you know look here there is a soul within and god above and you will be fine if i have not felt or experienced something in my life because it's not the words it is the state of consciousness which from which they were uttered and if i can unite with that state of consciousness become one with that state of consciousness i am not even talking of the highest state of consciousness and then i utter the same thing then it has a power because that state of consciousness is within me it can be activated accessed activated if i had glimpses of it then it may or may not work but the more i get rooted in that state of consciousness then the word has a power it has a meaning of course as i said there has to be a certain openness receptivity some kind of faith in the on the side of the patient and if it is not there then it is the task of the physician to gradually create that state many times it happens simply by contagion because patients come to a doctor unlike in a um, uh, other kinds of relationship they come with this openness they want to get healed so whatever is your own state automatically it's a matrix which is created so uh, this idea of interconnectedness is very much there in indian thought so healing is not from a doctor to a patient but healing takes place in a matrix when a patient comes and uh, you know communicates with a doctor or um, talks to a doctor shares there is an exchange there is a matrix of consciousness like a egg in which the two are shut together and uh, due to this um, by two two way communication two way interchange of energies there is one the changes that begin to come within a client so the doctor has to keep on working or the physician or the Uh, psychotherapist has to keep on working on his own states of consciousness whatever we are within that alone we can uh, only by that power we can help those who come in contact with us so this is the uh, whole big panoramic view of indian psychotherapy one once again 
that everything is within us the source is within us the divine nature is within us the power to heal the power to emerge victorious through all the challenges is within us second all challenges that we encounter in life all the crises are essentially evolutionary crises so they are not some uh, karma and bad karma good karma reward punishment or random chance accident they come to help us evolve so behind everything there is a wisdom that operates so if we understand what this wisdom is trying to not teach me is a way of saying but yeah it is trying to bring out something from within me the greater the crisis crisis the greater the challenge the greater the possibility so if we take it as a challenge then we will do all that is necessary to rise up to the challenge that's why the word used is rising up to the challenge to the occasion uh, then we grow and evolve and when we grow and evolve a time comes when this crisis which has uh, taken the form of you know situations and circumstances will fade away because we have risen to the challenge we have risen to the occasion we have undergone a change of consciousness within we have undergone a transmutation so all crises is essentially a cry for change and the change comes by evolution of consciousness and the means of evolving is through uh, through yoga now short of that also the third thing we can remember is that always in life there is that immediate a uh, smaller picture which we try to as i said paint dent you have relationship issues so you discuss communication problem you try to communicate better you try to you know look at the mistakes try to rectify both of them make a, uh, a swot analysis my strengths and weaknesses that's an extremely mental way of doing it and uh, in my experience all these things are very to an extent they help by making us conscious but Uh, how can we even analyze our strengths and weaknesses when we don't even we are not even equipped to see that you know uh, many things which we consider as weakness may be our greatest strengths i have seen people uh, say that i am very soft natured so uh, i can't be you know harsh they put it as weakness not realizing it's a soft power <laughs> if you shape it if you um, correctly you know uh, apply it then it is one of the greatest strength uh, so um, this all this kind of process is done away with so we understand that as long as one lives within this state of ignorance one is one's perceptions are all colored uh, take for example in a relationship issue now we are basically playing with perceptions we think it is that person and me but it's not that person and me it's my perception of that person and it is that person's perception of me so when we play with perception we are living in a world of lie anyways so at least my perception of that person should be correct how can my perception be correct as long as i am myself blinded and clouded by you know various things so what is the true perception in a more generic way well true perception is that everybody has within him something divine and if we can hold on to that aspect if we can communicate relate with that aspect even if all else is dark leave it aside don't struggle with that but just hold on to that which is beautiful which is the divine element however small and we can discover it only to the extent we have discovered the divine state within us we cannot discover it otherwise so the client who comes it should be a beginning um, starting point in his journey for his own ascension he should not just come and have a problem and he gets sorted out and he goes back that's not the purpose the purpose is to use this as a starting point on a tremendous journey on which the client and the therapist they become in a certain sense co-sharers it's like they become co-travelers one is maybe a little ahead and one a little behind doesn't matter so this is how the whole journey takes place and in this journey uh, indian psychological thought even expanded it to a cosmic level this journey is not alone it's not like one person and another person and third person that's a very um, what shall i say uh, it's by its very nature it's an ignorant thought how can they be all separate things hanging out in space each with its own origin uh, it's it's i mean an absurdity so there is an interconnectedness in creation because there is the same one presence call it divine or god or reality doesn't matter which is within everything and that is the ground in which there is the true oneness so once we understand that that there is an interconnectedness of this universe every aspect of life is a package so a human being doesn't come to a you know session and after a little brief interchange goes back reflects his whole life the way he lives 
So in Indian thought, yoga is not a set of practice or methods. Practice and methods are okay, but if your life is equally important, you know, for instance, living a life of moderation, certain practices like nishkam karma, practice of equanimity, uh, you know, um, uh, desires, but they should be under the uh, mastery of a more luminous thought. So this way, the entire way a person lives from morning till night, you know, life should become a prayer, an offering, a, a sacred journey. So that's how one has to look at it, the whole framework in which life operates. And in this process, there are helpers and there are, of course, uh, forces and powers that hinder. This, of course, one may or may not bring in, uh, but it's important to know at least that there are forces that help us. These forces that help human beings take the journey, um, move uh, to move forward in the journey are called the gods. Now, what happens, let's take an example uh, Disinvesting them of all those, um, you know, Mandir, Ganta, Devi Puja, Devta Puja. Just look at it like this. That why does it happen that, you know, despite all the challenges, problems, we feel burdened with, yet something in us endures. So there is in us a power which helps us to endure. That's how one has to look at, you know, the gods and goddesses. There are energies. And since there are energies... They belong to conscious beings. So even if we leave that aside, there is within us some kind of a uh, capacity, some kind of a potential that helps us to endure. Similarly with struggle, what gives us the strength to fight and either master, overcome or else even if to fall, fall nobly, not ignobly, to fight and fall. So this power that helps us to fight, take the challenge of life, uh, is another kind of power. What is that power in us which loves harmony and equilibrium? So there are forces which help us ascend in the journey. Similarly, there are forces that hinder. It is as important to understand that. There are people who go into abnormal states of depression. They become suicidal. Now, these are completely intra-rational forces. So Indian thought always believed that rational mind um, is only a small bandwidth. Rational mind, the imaginative mind, the physical mind, the sense-bound mind, which we know is a small bandwidth. Below that, there are completely infrarational forces. People who get angry, you try to reason with them. People who are afraid, you try to reason with them. People who become aggressive and violent, you try to reason with them. It doesn't work because they are completely infernal, infrarational forces. And if you uh, allow them to take siege of our nature, they can completely destroy. Not only human beings, they can destroy group life, they can destroy civilizations and <laughs> leave aside nations they have done that so there are infrarational infernal elements which had a role in the early stages of evolution and so they continue to exist in us as our evolutionary past so it drags us back so these are the elements which time to time come up they hinder our journey but actually they are meant to make our journey more and more perfect but they they their method is very dark they show us that look here this not yet corrected and they sometimes show much more than what exists. So one has to be so conscious and vigilant. They are the one which drag us into depression, precipice, despair, uh, feelings of complete unworthiness, helplessness, which from the rational perspective, you know it is not there. I mean to another person. But that time that person feels that life is all worthless, useless. And ultimately, they lead us to suicide. So in yogic terminology, they are known as hostile forces. In ancient thought, they were known as asuras, rakshasas, pishachas. Uh, basically, they are not, uh, you know, we are not aware of them. But they exist in creation because they were our evolutionary past. In the beginning, when life was very tough, these are the forces that came up. Um, so they continue to exist in creation and continue to exist within us. The dinosaur is dead outside, but... The fascination with the dinosaur way of life does exist within us. But equally, there are superconscious forces. And these are the gods which are beyond the rational framework. So how do we access these forces? Well, the traditional methods are prayers, aspiration, of course, uh, um, meditation by uh, the will and aspiration to you know, grow into a higher light, a greater consciousness. But most importantly, the simplest of way which at least in Indian thought has been there is surrender to the divine. Because all these forces, superconscious forces, move up and up to their origin. So ultimately, who are these gods? They are powers of the divine, which are operating in creation. Powers of the one divine. 
operating in creation to help us. So these benevolent energies can help us move up. And the simplest way is when we really with faith and trust surrender to the divine that we want to come out of this state. At least with that will and faith that we want to come out and then the grace acts and you know helps us recover. Not only grace, there is grace of course and there is a power which operates in creation, the greatest of all powers and that is love. So love is the power which uh, is laboring in creation to pull creation out and uh, make it join the creator. It's this power. In human beings it takes a different form altogether but still even in human beings when one is in love, during the moment one is in love, one cannot harbor this energy for long. Life grows beautiful. There are many people who, who you know go through depression and who go through sadness, who go through anger. It's because they don't have, they have closed their doors to love. It's not that they don't have love, but they've closed their doors to love. How do they close their door? By always wanting more and more. That's why desires become unhealthy after a point because you are constantly wanting. So because you are constantly wanting and nature and creation cannot give you endlessly. For that you have to have a very wide vessel. And the wide vessel gives, you become wide by giving. So there is a paradox that if we are small and we want and want endlessly, the door will be shut. Shut by the very desires which are filling. You see, there is a small vessel and you want gold. So after a point, the very fact that uh, gold has reached the brim, you can't receive it. So when you don't receive it, you feel it is not coming. So you are wanting more and more, but you are not receiving anything. Now if the same vessel receives the gold and keeps transmitting it, keeps emptying it into some vault, let us say. So this gold keeps on coming within it. Gold is a bad example, but anyways, <laughs> that is the one we connect with desires. But anything for that matter. So... The more we give, the more we receive the power of love, which is all around in creation. So, um, we don't know how to tap this power. And, you, and uh, that's why one of the simplest cures which we all can uh, experience in life is by loving someone. But love a plant, you know, nowadays people talk about hugging a cow or, you know, loving a pet. Love a plant, love a pet, love human beings. Um, Release the energy of love so that you can receive more. Don't be shut in that state that, oh, somebody doesn't love me. Okay, he doesn't love you. You can love. What is, what is the problem? Oh, he will not love me. It doesn't matter. <laughs> By opening your doors to releasing this energy of love, you will become a wide vessel. And when you become a wide vessel, love will come from every side because you are releasing this energy in this atmosphere. So you are becoming freer and ultimately to love the creator. So this is... Um, one of the things which is there in Indian thought to enlarge, to widen, to grow vast. And then uh, another very interesting thought with which we can close is purification. So every energy of our nature is uh, like a raw material. Uh, let's take this example of love. So love is a raw product. Now we all use the word love. Everybody uses the word love. Even somebody who is extremely possessive, dominating, who want, full of jealousies, hate, also believes that one loves. And there is a truth in it. <laughs> but it is a love of the lowest kind. You know. So you can purify this energy. And as you purify this energy, love can become more and more resplendent. You know, It's like uh, a beautiful um, a diamond which is lying in, uh, in, in mud and dust and Mayar of earth nature. So you take it out, you you wash it, you clean it, you you cleanse it with fire because there may be some stains which will not go just by cleaning. So by this fire, by this aspiration that you want things to become better, love becomes a luminous angel. So this is another part and this same applies to knowledge. Knowledge, what we call as knowledge is nothing but again a gold mint which is valueless. Uh, it is again covered with so this thirst for knowledge, how to refine knowledge, the instruments of knowledge. Same with will. Will is very weak. But by purification, you can make it higher and higher and higher. And what is the best way to purify the simplest, easiest, straight and direct and fastest is by uh, joining our imperfect, limited, gross, uh, dirt-ridden earth nature with the divine. Because that is a purifying fire. And uh, when we apply the fire of aspiration to all that is impure. So instead of turning outwardly and trying to change others, oh, she has done this with me, uh, this happened in my outer life. Instead of that, uh, we pray and aspire that our capacity to face life, to face this challenge increases. 
so when we do that gradually all the energies um, through which we take the challenge of life they begin to become subtler refined more and more purified here purity has very little to do with moral and ethical purity moral and ethical purity also has some truth because it's like a fire but it's not the ultimate thing this purity means ultimately all these energies should be submitted to the divine will and the divine will can act upon us ultimately this divine will is operating in creation pushing things in a certain direction and that's why life never fulfills our mental plans but it fulfills a larger plan if we try to look at look in that direction so we should always understand that there are two plans of life one is what we have planned if life runs according to that if at all that means well um evolution has forgotten us but um, there is another plan the original plan um, that is not the backup plan it's the original plan and that keeps pushing us despite ourselves despite our wishes and desires towards that point where we should be tune into this original plan uh, we can access it by looking inside in some quiet moment instead of uh, asking god what we want we should ask god what god wants from us to put it that way and uh, what is the divine will within us so if we do that with some sincerity some persistent after some time we'll begin to get a deeper inner indication as to which way our life should go so all this we can help even the client to realize so clients will come and say oh i wanted this um uh, this happened and that happened so when they have when there is this first stage is catharsis the poison is out the poison of bitterness anger disappointment frustration then you ask them that well what do you really want from life then we will see that the true nature was covered right from childhood the parents put us on a wrong track then the school put us on a wrong track the society put us on a wrong track something for which we were never meant to be we are meant to be something else then you see deep within within that there is something else which the divine wants from us and in us and even if we cannot completely change track at a certain point of time we can surely start opening another door another channel another track through which our life can run as a parallel stream which supports our outer life in common parlance it is said cultivating a hobby but that's not the right word it is touching that real bedrock which is the real stream the lupt saraswati which is you know running inside us and when you tap that real saraswati then the ganga and yamuna of life find their significance and begin to balance each other so we all must discover that vilupt saraswati that hidden stream of the divine will which wants our life to be in a certain way for our good and if you discover it one is fortunate so spend some time in reflecting on what really uh, not my surface ego wants from life not what society wants but what is my true soul nature it is called as swabhava and swadharma and try to find some way to express it and manifest it in life so this is the broad landscape uh, or soul scape of a journey if there are questions i'll be happy to take them namaste hi good afternoon sir good afternoon um in the morning we were having a class and this is a very technical question per se so we were discussing this with our teacher that um and we started with this ki um indian psychology the whole knowledge base is through the experience of yogis the whole uh, knowledge base so who is a yogi a sage sant so um because uh, especially these days it's a title that can also be very controversial and it's not all like is it fair to call someone a yogi or a sant like so yeah yeah good question so i'll i'll put it uh, across so you know these confusions have arisen in our minds because uh, you know we have got disconnected from our way of life so yogi number one yogi had has nothing to do with anything outer this was asked by arjuna uh, to shri krishna in the gita who is really a bhakta for instance bhakta has nothing to do with going to temple and dancing and singing bhajans so i can tell you that for sure uh, bhakta is marked by certain inner signs uh, karma yogi is marked by certain inner signs gyan yogi is marked by certain inner signs so this whole idea of 
trying to find a yogi by the dress he wears, by the eloquence of his speech, by his scriptural reading. None of this is true. Okay, number one. He may or may not do these things. It's up to him. Uh, he's a free man if he is truly a yogi. He is not bound by a set of clothes. Okay, that's number one. And we don't want that kind of a paradigm where yogis are separate and human beings are separate. Every human, let's put it practically, every human being has a potential yogi inside. All that is meant by yoga is that one is striving to go beyond the limited human frame. Everybody who in some way or the other is striving, maybe you know just sitting in meditation for uh, half an hour and trying to find a deeper purpose in life. Or somebody who is practicing just to be peaceful in the face of adverse situation. Everybody whether labeled or not labeled or trying to find a deeper love, a truer understanding. All of this is we may use the word apprentice yogi. When he uses, makes this process more and more conscious, when he's praying, for example, not praying just to uh, get a particular result or wish fulfillment, but praying for uh, becoming a better human being, for making this world a better place, all of it where a human being tries to ascend to a state which is higher than our limited frame uh, for knowledge, uh, aspires for love, for, for peace, for harmony, uh, one is a yogi. Okay, that's one. Uh, and then, of course, there are several levels of yoga and I'm not going into that. So that's why I'm using the word apprentice yogi. Uh, second part is that yoga is not a belief system. So it's not, it is not based on the experience of saints and sages, but it's based on the experience of these experiences are replicable. So here there is a difference between the Western context and the Indian context. In the Western context, also there are yogis, but you have to just believe in them. So it becomes a religion or a theology. So we don't believe in religion or a theology. We believe that a yogi can uh, awaken us toward that journey, can transmit that state of consciousness in us, can actually help us arrive and make us also grow into a yogi. That's why in Indian thought it was ashramas. It was not a yogi going around and preaching and you know others have to just believe. Yes, there is God, there is soul within. No. He will show us the way to find our soul. He will show us that there is a way to access this higher state of consciousness, this being, the divine being and if you follow sincerely you will arrive. That's how all yoga is based on that. Otherwise who would want to continue on a journey which is just based on belief? I would not at least for sure. So you know because as you keep growing you experience some changes or the other depending on your sincerity. Conditions are there for anything. Take for example one wants to do and you know in my case I can tell you MBBS and MD. I can't just say that I'm in a medical school, automatically give me the degree. There were people in my, uh, you know, uh, doing MBBS with me in FMC Pune and uh, they were there for 10 years. They were into drugs. Now you can't tell them that, look here, they can't say, Ki, you know, you give me a degree just because I've been here for long. So in yoga also, conditions apply. It's not enough to be initiated into a path. One has to walk the way. And all these ways are laid down. The beauty of Indian thought is not one way, hundreds of ways. Why? Because we believe that human natures are different. And based on each one's nature, that's why in the beginning I was saying you can't make a universal formula. Based on individual nature and its variation, one walks the path. So we should not worry about calling somebody a yogi, saint, sage. If one is truly a saint, sage, a yogi, one is least bothered. You see, Shurabindo's name, never any prefix was fixed. Somebody tried to fix Maharishi, people tried to do that. He said, simple Shirobindo is uh, enough. How does it make a difference to the yogi's realization? So this idea of putting these prefixes and honorifics, even Swami and then Ananda behind, all this belongs to an age which we are leaving behind. Now we are entering an age when you will see yogis without being titled as yogis, which is something very beautiful so that all this show and sham and, you know, sometimes we get fooled. Definitely, sometimes we get cheated because for if you start depending on dress, it is like a doctor who can just puts outside a name plate and on his card says foreign returned, you know, FSCP, all kinds of degrees. You get cheated. So the sign of yogin is inside. And it is not um, important whether one accepts them as a yogi or not. It is enough if you have an aspiration and you feel that this person can really help you grow in your journey. That's all that is required. Does it answer your question? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Sir, uh, sir, one question. Good afternoon, yes, sir. Ma
So am I audible? Yes, very much. Uh, so you talked about true soul nature and to reflect upon that. So, sir, uh, can you tell us some method how to do it, how to reflect upon? Yes, psychological methods I'll tell you. See, uh, look at oneself and what is driving one to anything. Let's say if I am doing medicine, for example. I can tell you, share with my own journey. So, uh, I got into a medical school around 16 and a half years, which, you know, uh, why? Because uh, my mom said I wanted to be a writer. My mom told me, Are to likhega uh, poetry se kya tera sansar cha chalega. I asked her, what do you want me to become? She said, Dr. Banja. So I said, okay. So I appeared for the competitive exams and I got through everything. So I went into medicine. <laughs> then I looked deep inside and I found that whole thing very stifling, very small. I said, ye kya hai medicine? Mein ye? We are manipulating the body, thinking it is everything. So now I realize that people go into this because, you know, I had colleagues simply because they have this, either this ambition, becoming doctor is like, you know, a big person and then, you know, join the Air Force. Um, I was in, uh, you know, medical armed forces, medical setup. So you're a big man, you're an officer. I saw that all these things operate. So I said, I don't want to do anything for these things. They are, they are irrelevant, uh, you know, but there were people who were driven by that or desire for money and all this. Then when you strip yourself bare, then you realize these things have been thrown upon you by the society. They are not natural to you. And then I realized, well, there is in me a need to help people. Rightly or wrongly, there is in me a need to help. There is some kind of kindness. There is some kind of frustration because of the world the way it is. I don't like to see evil in the world and suffering and pain. Then I realized that what really is my true soul nature? It is to be compassionate and an instrument of light. So, okay, I can do it in medicine. So, I went into psychiatry, ignorantly believing that in psychiatry I can have some kind of, you know, <laughs> light. But I realized a greater darkness there. You're not supposed to even mention about yoga. First thing my teacher told me, don't talk about yoga and spirituality here. <laughs> so anyways, so that's how it was. Now, of course, my teacher hears some of my talks and says, oh, very nice. <laughs> You're doing good work. But that time it was, don't talk about yoga. Don't talk about spirituality. Because Western paradigm, in which, you know, we have to move within that operating system. So, ultimately I discovered, well, this which I am doing is a job, this not me. So, when you remove all these things which are moving us because of greed for money, uh, of course, people will tell you, are khayega kaise, jiega kaise, as if, you know, paisa khata hai koi insan. Let me tell you, you know, all these are false thoughts which, you know, one carries. Be yourself, be your true self. So do what gives you the deepest joy. That which gives not surface joy. Surface joy is like, okay, merko party karna acha lagta hai. Do what gives you a deepest joy. Doing which you feel deep inside the wages of contentment which come right away. And do it as you breathe. And everybody is given something. But the problem is we lose it because we are all the time looking, for, uh, looking at other people. So when we look at ourselves deep within, we'll, we'll discover that little seed lying somewhere, hidden. Hidden by ambitions, desires, greed, all these social notions which, you know, surround us and harden the ego shell. Ye banna hai, wo banna hai. 99% percent uh, usko dek, Harvard mein hai, wo um, UK mein hai. Just get rid of all that, stay quiet and look inside and see what is it that gives you the deepest joy. But as I said many times, it becomes very difficult when one has chosen a stream. So pick it up as a parallel stream. And then who knows, one day it will become your mainstream. So that's how one has to go. It, it's a tough calling and needs a very sincere inlook into oneself. Uh, don't give these explanations ki, are lekin ye to impractical hai. Uh, one question which I often ask people when they come for counseling or something. I said, supposing, supposing there were no ifs and buts. Then what would you like to do? Otherwise they say, sir, karna to ye chate lekin. I said, nee, lekin chhod do ek second ke liye. Supposing you had all the money and all the possibilities and everything, what would you like to do then? That is somewhere you will touch your true calling. So touch that true calling and then catch it and help it to grow. Now the way we live is probably you can help it to grow as a side dish till it becomes your main dish. This is the plant inside. If you nurture it and nourish it, you would have done enough for yourself and for the world. While outside, you may still operate within the framework of the job you are doing for the sake of some money. So it's okay. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, very much. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. So, my question is, how can we make Indian psychology less prescriptive and also less religious since there are people who complain that if I don't really believe in religion or these things applies when we heard of these stories of Bhagavad Gita or of any other scriptures, we may apply it for a few days and then after we just lose or forget these things and just again messed up in our reality or ego-based reality. So how can we make it less prescriptive? Okay. So first, uh, first thing first that, you know, uh, we must be very clear that in Indian thought there is nothing like religion. It may shock us, but uh, there was there is yoga and the way to yoga. And uh, this reality can be called by hundred names. That's how the Veda puts it. You know, Ekam Sad Vipra Bhauda Vadanti. It's the bane of a Western kind of thought that it brought the Vedas at parallel with, let us say, the Bible and the Quran. Where you have to believe, that's it. In Vedas, there is nothing like belief. If there is one reality, you seek it, access it. If you don't want to seek it, don't seek it. There is nothing like a blasphemy or conversion or anything like that. So it's a seeking for going beyond the human. Now, if the, this seeking is there within us, then only the doors of, we may use the word yoga, we may use the word, uh, uh, what shall I say, bhoga if you want, because bhoga means to enjoy life and it's a greater enjoyment. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So, the important point is, do we want to be happy within the human formula? Then there is religion at the most or no religion. It both stand at the same level. Theism and atheism in the human formula are at the same level. Sometimes atheism is better because it opens the door to a search. <laughs> because poor fellow has nothing to believe in. Um, and theism equally... At least it believes there is a greater reality to do that extent it can comfort. But in Indian thought, in spiritual Indian spiritual thought, one the whole question to be asked is: Are you satisfied with the human formula? If yes, fine, continue. There is no way of imposing, and one should not try to impose. If you want to go further, then there is something greater. Now look at the Bhagavad Gita. There is no religion in it. In fact, the Bhagavad Gita doesn't talk about anything religious. What is happening in the dialogue is that uh, Arjuna is in a state of crisis. So he turns to the one person who is accessible to him. And he asks him that, well, what do I do? It's a problem of action. There is nothing like... A, and the beauty of Bhagavad Gita is, uh, just to talk about you know this aspect, that Bhagavad Gita doesn't solve the problem in a religious way at all. It doesn't say, do this, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not injure. If you do this, you will rot in hell. You will, If you do this, you will go to heaven. There is none of these things. It doesn't even prescribe that every day go to temple, uh, do agarbati. See, we have not read it, so we find it. It, it doesn't say any of these things. Bhagavad Gita doesn't care whether you go to a temple or whether you go to this or don't go anywhere. It speaks about inwardly what you should be. It speaks about equanimity, it speaks about nishkam karma and all of them can be logically understood and practiced. It does speak about surrender, but surrender to what? To a greater reality which far exceeds us. And yes, Sri Krishna gives the vision of that greater reality. That's a, that's if one wants, but that's a magnificent thing because then you understand that this greater reality is not a personal God whom we worship, but it's a reality which is imminent in the whole creation. What does Arjuna see there in terms of God? He sees that one in whom all are there. The Arjuna and Karna and the good, the bad, evil, everything is going inside and coming out of it more and more purified and refined. So he sees this reality as imminent, universal and transcendent. So in Indian thought, God is not God, God of the religions. But it is a reality, source, call it Tao, doesn't matter, which is there in each one, which is there in creation, which is logical. If there is a source, it is bound to be there. And it is it transcends the creation because obviously that is the origin, so it transcends. So that's all. We should put it in these terms. Now, one may believe, um, you know, access it by the name Krishna. Uh, one may access him, as, even Krishna has so many names, okay? <laughs> so one can access him as Anam, doesn't matter. Uh, one may access it at Akal. Uh, depends upon uh, what approach you have. There are some who will approach it through religion, perfectly fine. They approach through worship, they approach it through a master, which is perfectly fine. 
we should be very wide and liberal but there are others who don't want to approach it like that they want to just practice inner meditation so the gita says that you can take this approach you can meditate like this practice this you will arrive so we should try to uh, actually first ourselves be well ingrained in it when we see then we'll discover there is no religious thought in gita the way we understand religion but there is the divine with whom we are connecting now of course if one has a problem with the divine perfectly fine talk about states of consciousness though it is the most illogical thing to do to say that there are states of consciousness beyond human uh, <laughs> and a, even a higher state but that higher state is not conscious of itself what is being when we say being of god it is a being who is self conscious now how am i a being it's because i am aware of myself that's what so that state which is beyond human if there is a state then and that too which is supreme consciousness highest consciousness the whole creation is nothing but a grain of dust scattered if you look at it just look at the stars so that consciousness is aware of itself so is it a being or it is not a being so being is not a dadi wala being you know wearing a human form being is this but this being can be realized by a human being so that's why there is the divine being whom you can call by any name approach any which way it doesn't have any form but it can assume any form so when yogis realize that being then we regard them as representatives of god or guru we can we give them a naturally because through them we have connected through that divine being so divine being of uh, yoga is not a religious being who is uh, applicable to a faithful few who will punish you if you don't believe in him who is going to reward you if you believe in him who will book for you a seat in heaven after death none of these things these are completely westernized notions semitic religions which we have i don't know why accepted them as true to us because they threw these thoughts and we were disconnected with our own you know Uh, profound scriptures so we thought yes yes it is true but when you delve into the gita it is so liberating in fact gita will liberate us from religion and give us the true insight about life so that's how we have to teach it and most important we must practice it it cannot be uh, you know done in a mental way obviously Uh, then we will be picking up one practice or another and transposing it. Uh, we won't carry authenticity. It's like if I have not done MBBS, but I can pick up paracetamol and uh, you know, like medical um, shops, they give medicine, but it is not authentic. It may help me for a while, but it's not authentic. So authenticity comes when we try to live a teaching. So if we live a teaching, it's to improve the human condition. There is nothing religious about it. I personally do believe that Bhagavad Gita should be taught in schools. It may sound a very strange religious thought, because it is something which will help human beings to become better. And it is not like teaching the Bible and Quran also. Excuse me, because it doesn't help the human condition to become better. I can say this on the basis of having read all these scriptures. Bhagavad Gita, of all the scriptures, I understand not teaching Ramayana and Mahabharata. there may be religious connotation but bhagavad gita is one scripture which helps human beings become better truly better and in a very secular way in a very vast way that's the beauty of that uh, wonderful book it's so liberating this person who is really living the truth of the gita will cannot think in terms of religion in fact if you look at the whole conflict arjuna and duryodhana are the same religious people <laughs> they both believe in the same god it's about dharma and adharma dharma is very different from religion dharma is that which helps us evolve individually and collectively towards a greater becoming towards a greater manifestation so that's something very beautiful anybody with an thirst for progress would love it so because progress cannot be only unidimensional which is technological progress has to be all round in human consciousness if we don't progress then we will be stuck where we are with nuclear piles at our beck and call so that's how i look at it i mean that's how most people would look at the gita but if they want to make it a religious book put it every day in their silk and strings read it and feel happy nothing wrong with that that's perfectly fine to do that but it's a book of real life yeah okay good afternoon sir good afternoon uh, yes sir sir i had a question like how do we connect to the divine within us like what can i like we do to like connect with that divinity within us or how, how can i see that wonderful question 
Okay, so uh, you can connect first of all in any which way. There is no particular way through which, uh, let's take for example, um, you are trapped in a room which is dark, okay? And you want, you start with this trust that there is somewhere light and you want to seek the light. Start with this seeking. And why I am saying so? Because the divine with whom you want to connect is as keen to enter and flood you with light. So the whole premise of yoga which takes this route, there are yogas which don't believe in a divine being, which is also okay, which believe in an impersonal reality. But the moment you bring in this kind of tr implicit trust that there is a divine being, and now I'm not going into its philosophical semantics, that implies that this divine being who knows much more, he has planted the seeking in your heart. He is seeking you, that's why you are seeking. So, of course he knows us, but he is preparing you through this seeking for his own self-revelation in you. So, when you understand that, then what will be the natural means? One, you will seek. Seek by any which means. Aspire. Uh, while And this aspiration doesn't only have to be at a fixed time. When you are taking a walk, when you are eating, enter into this state of inner contemplation. You can set aside a time separately that I want to know what this divine being is. That's a very good thing. I don't want to just believe. I want to know. So whom will you ask? Ask him or her or that whatever way you want to put it. Ask him that I want to know about you. I don't know. I've been told there is something like you out there or out here <laughs> and seek him. So this is the step one is seeking, aspiration. Then you ask him, involve him in everyday activity of your life. Don't keep him in the cupboard. Don't keep him only for a, you know, a temple visit or a, you know, uh, when you go for a, a mosque or church or Gurudwara. No. Take him along with you. Make him your friend. It will transform life. He is a friend of friends. So take him and not like, you know, he's a guru who will, you know, come and tell you, do this and don't do this. He's not like that. He is a lover. That's why we all that we experience comes from that. So our human love is a very pale reflection of that eternal lover. Our human joy is just a very um, mixed up cocktail of uh, you know pleasure and pain of that which is all bliss. That momentary peace we experience is comes from that ultimate peace which passes all understanding. Uh, the little beauty we experience in life is from that effulgent beauty and radiance. So tell him that, you know, be with me. Take him along for a walk. And um, everywhere, you know, when you're taking a bath, tell him that I want you to pour yourself and cleanse me fully. When you dress up, dress up with this idea that he is watching you. When you go for class, when you study, go for work, make him your friend. And I can tell you that uh, it will be the most richly rewarding friendship that you have ever encountered. And uh, if you do this, then you will form a bond. See, from the divine side, the bond is always there. We are the one who have to start activating it. So he has given us a mobile. That mobile is the human body or the human consciousness. You have to press the button and connect. So the button is, you can take God's name. You can do it with thoughts toward the divine. But there are some simple ways. Like simply, when you give a name and form to him, it becomes easy. Otherwise, it becomes a little more difficult. You know, he is a formless being somewhere. One can do it. But it's very simple to give him a name and a form. Give the name and form to which you easily feel connected. It could be anyone. I mean, of course, uh, even people have done it by giving a name and form regarding somebody close to them as divine being and they have realized. The story is like that. But much better if there is, you know, there are so many examples of those who have realized the divine. Uh, you connect with them, read their literature, what they have said about the divine. This reading helps the ground of consciousness within us to prepare. And of course, they have all given away. Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda, Sri Aurobindo, the Gita. There are things in the Western context also, some literature, but much of it has been covered simply because it took the turn of religion. And that religion in the Western and the Middle East concept completely wiped away the spiritual element. Yes, completely. There is very little of it left because it didn't believe in an evolutionary process. But in Indian thought, because there were countless saints and sages through evolution, you kept on making it accessible to people. Uh, Sanskrit in the Vedic age, then you see the Middle Ages, it is in Avadhi, it is in Gurumukhi, because you know people believe that doesn't matter in different languages. Modern age, English, 
so uh, in indian thought because of this evolutionary process that sanatan dharma took so you can access it through any of these doors and uh, doesn't matter he is waiting for you he is walking with you and he will reveal uh, himself to you in due course of time surrender again because if he is there if he is really <laughs> worth the divine he will take care how to reveal himself to you live with this trust and make him your friend don't make him distant by regarding him as guru and teacher make him your friend make him your father mother uh, you can argue with him no problem okay so he he loves to play the game of love um sir so uh, when you were like talking about we have certain plans for life and if we look at the larger picture if they don't work out because life had certain other plans for mm-hmm. us those mm-hmm. were so um i was having the same conversation with a friend a few days ago and what turned up is so that every time how we plan things how we intended to do things it doesn't work out so we cannot get out of it every time by saying ki life had bigger plans because hamari fir responsibility or nahi uh, nahi nee, bilkul theek hai aur main i am glad you asked this question uh, because i let me tweak the question a little i am not saying that it doesn't work out therefore there is a larger plan hmm. okay uh, that is not the sign in fact you must face the challenge of life if it doesn't work out meaning thereby that you are not succeeding in it don't take it that god wants you to give you success and therefore there is a larger plan is that correct am i putting it yes, uh, yes. more correctly yes. yeah so what is the criteria of the plan it is not outer success it is the joy you take in taking on that which you are doing that joy if it is missing in what you are doing then look twice why is it missing see i, I am telling you frankly about like myself you know i took up psychiatry i didn't get joy into it the way it was being taught and the way it was being imposed and i realized that this is not how i want so i started exploring anyways i had started exploring and i discovered no there is something else something much better much greater so look into that aspect that if you are not getting joy now before doing that there are some elementary practice of yoga take joy in whatever you do that's a different practice but you must look inside that is this activity in which you are engaged in is it really giving you the deep sense of growth of progress of satisfaction it is nothing to do with outer success outwardly one may fail and yet it has given you the joy of taking on that challenge and uh, facing it and you know trying to master it even in that failure and fall there is the sense of contentment it's like playing a game so you don't play it for uh, winning you win it's beautiful but you play because you are a, you enjoy to play it playing it so take it like that that will be a much correct criteria uh, and again it's not permanent that at one point of time let me give this example that you know you take up a job and you are getting a joy then after some time it fades away so there are things given for a time we start believing it is eternal so for example you give a promise and uh, in a relationship and two people come together there is a joy does it mean that it has been sanctioned by heaven till eternity that's how you know <laughs> roman catholics will believe no it is meant to give you a certain kind of experience of growth at a point of time if you can grow with it further go ahead if you cannot grow it has become stifling it is blocking you from every side branch out lead your life alone or tomorrow who knows you know you find someone else so don't get blocked simply because of outer success and failure things may not work out that's okay but whether you are growing through that experience whether there is joy ultimately this journey is about progress about conscious evolution and in that process joy is one very important criteria inner joy so keep these two as your yardstick whether any activity you have taken is helping you to progress or not success and failure are worldly things relative things don't make that a criteria all right thank yeah you. thank you thank you so much namaste okay thank you namaste thank you sir thank you thank you thank, thank you, you.